Hi, Heather. Hi, Ross. Good to How see you. How are you? Fine, thank you. Congratulations on your new job. Looking oh, forward to it. Thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well, with, with utter terror. But um, I would be, too. I, I don't know how you've got the uh, courage to even do this today. I would be in a constant uh, worry mode right now, so I'm glad to talk to you before you get... <laughs> Well, I'm drinking, I'm drinking coffee, and I'm, you know, doing a lot of sit-ups and push-ups and so on and trying to get ready. Um, <laughs> brain, for a, brain business, good. Yeah, the brain brain exercises, too. Um, but so for for those of you who don't know us, I'm Ross Douthit, um, and I'm a senior editor at The Atlantic, and I'm soon to be starting as a columnist for The New York Times, and I'm here with... I'm Heather McDonald. I'm a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and I write for City Journal, which is the Institute's... Urban Affairs Quarterly. Also, I contribute to a blog known as Secular Right. Secular Right, and that is sort of what we're here to talk about today. Um, we're going to try and talk a little bit about religion and American conservatism and maybe even religion in general, so really tackling the big questions. Um, but I, and I thought I'd start out, Heather, by just telling those of our viewers who don't know that you have distinguished yourself over the past... Has it been the past year or two, would you say, um, in writing critically and pretty extensively about um, uh, the, I guess you'd say, the relationship between religion and American conservatism? Well, we both contributed to a forum in the American Conservative. That's right. That was several Ross. years ago, right? Yeah, I think that was that 2005, maybe. Right, and that and that, that got was, a lot of people mad, right? Your contribution. Yeah, I, I take it. I, fortunately, I wasn't on the receiving end, and I, I think they sort of uh, screened the the mad uh, letters that they were getting. But but I was arguing there, Ross, and I've continued to do so that uh, conservatism does not need religion to ground itself. I had been hearing increasingly uh, over the years of the 2000s at conservative cocktail party statements like what makes conservatives superior to liberals or, or Republicans superior to Democrats or indeed Americans superior to Europeans was their religious faith. Uh, I would hear conservative pundits say that without religion there can be no morality. And I, I wanted to make a case that, in fact, uh, the, the core conservative values, things like uh, recognizing the essential nature of personal responsibility, the importance of two-parent families, respect for the rule of law, and an appreciation of the uh, vibrancy of, of entrepreneurship and, and the Im in inevitable failure of government to try and run either an economy or families, that those are, are secular values. They can be grounded on reason, on an observation of human nature and uh, evidence and that to bring any kind of appeal to revelation into a political discourse, I find, uh, is a conversation stopper. It works for people that share uh, one's faith, but it is an irrelevancy to people who don't. And secular right uh, has also been arguing that morality comes out of a human innate moral sense, and that what's known as religious values, and I would say the only real religious values are the fourth, first four commandments, uh, the rest are human values, religion is, is parasitic on humans' own uh, moral sense, and that there is not an apocalypse looming as society becomes more secular. In fact, you know, there's, there's less of a difference that separates the religious and the non-religious today than there is between today's anodyne, tolerant, meek and mild uh, ecumenical religion, which has been sort of whooped into minding its manners by enlightenment values of tolerance and the crusading, uh, truth-asserting religion of the past. So conservatives' appeals to religion today I find a little ahistorical I, I always want to ask, whose religion, from which period should we be enforcing the Sabbath again? You know, all of us, certainly our businesses, are, are violating uh, the Lord's commandment. Uh, should we go back to that religious time? So, so generally, I, I've just been saying that conservatism can ground itself, and indeed ought to ground itself, on, 
on evidence that is available to all and not, not on religious revelation. So how do you think that a secular conservative should think about religion, and I mean, religion generally, but also religion in, um, I mean, I guess we can say in the West, but in the United States in particular. I mean, as, you know, if you're a secular conservative sort of invested in, um, in sort of conservative ideas of what America has been and what it should continue to be and so forth, how do you look at the role that um, Christianity in general, religion and so forth, has played in, in American society? Well, it's obviously been a great source of strength to many people, and and religious faith has allowed people to overcome extraordinary sorrow and suffering. It has given them courage to uh, fight injustice. There's no question that religious faith played a, a massive role in the civil rights movement. Uh, and it has inspired great works, there's no question. But... This was a nation founded on secular principles. God was deliberately left out, or if, if you take Hamilton, they simply forgot to put God into the into the Constitution, which is a, itself, I think, a, uh, uh, if he was at all serious about that, is a, is a statement of their uh, notion of the relative importance of religion in, in the American public. Uh, so I, th I think that as much as it's been important for private Individuals, it is not necessary for a sense of what America's primary values are. And those come out of, of uh, Locke more than Jesus, frankly. Um, so we are a religious nation, there's no question. But again, the argument that secular right and I am making is that uh, the values that we hold dear are, are human values. Those American values are human values. Right. And I would also say, Russ, you've, you've recently been arguing uh, on your blog about the Pope's visit to Africa, and he's been challenged and, and criticized for not placing primary importance on condoms as a way of, of uh, stopping the spread of AIDS. And you've argued that it is as moral and as frankly, as, as scientific to argue for uh, sexual responsibility and modesty. And there, again, is a, is a place where I would agree with you. I don't think we need to ground that in religious values. As a conservative, I couldn't agree with you more that uh, sexual promiscuity is a threat uh, at its extremes to social order and is also a a vast, unacknowledged contributor to AIDS, both here and, and in Africa. So, so again, our values are the same. Uh, whether you draw them primarily from uh, religious teachings, I think they're also available through uh, the use, again, of, of looking at evidence and, and what societies need to sustain themselves. Right. No, and I, I mean, I, let's see. Well, there, there are a few things I would say. I mean, one thing I think is that, you know, I, I think that there's a mistake that a lot of conservatives make, which is the mistake of assuming that because at this particular historical moment, religion, but I mean, specifically when you're talking about the United States, you're largely talking about Christianity, the assumption that sort of that religious force is in its essence a conservative force as opposed to just being a force that, you know, at this moment, you know, in, let's say, post-sexual revolution America, right, um, the sort of Christian teachings on sexual morality and so on tend to line up with sort of traditional conservative ideas about sexual morality. But obviously, if you look back across the sweep of Christian history and world history and so on, religion has been a force in all kinds of political directions. And I, I don't think that anybody living in, you know, first or second century, first or second century Roman Empire would, ha would have been confused and thought that Christianity <laughs> was a, you know, conservative force in, um, in, in, in that society. And, and that's been true across the board. I mean, and it's been true across the sweep of American history. I mean, I, I don't think that you can claim or pretend that Martin Luther King, um, f for instance, was embarked on, well, ultimately a conservative project um, 
in the 1950s and 1960s. But I mean, I think there are also there's also sort of, and, and this goes to these endless deep debates about you know what is conservatism, right? I mean, is right. conservatism is conservatism you know defined by a kind of you know a bedrock set of values and principles and so forth, or is it um, sort of conservatism in the sense in a kind of you know uh, a kind of um, sort of uh, you know extremely simplistic gloss on Edmund Burke? You know, is it something that is you know the the defense of sort of the embedded wisdom of the past against the sort of fashions of the present and a defense of reform but a resistance to revolution and so so on and so forth. In and in that case, then conservatism, you know, what is conservative in one era is you know is not conservative in another and so on. And I think I, I mean I think there are sort of layers of complexity that get obscured in. In these in these kind of debates, I mean, is you know, to a lot of a lot of American conservatives, right, are are conservatives of you know they are interested in cons- conserving liberalism, right? The you know the John Locke and Alexander Hamilton and so forth that you talked about, but clearly in the 17th and 18th century, John Locke and Alexander Hamilton were not conservatives. So you you, you know that you have a sort of all the way down problem that applies to both conservatism and Christianity, I think, where you know, it, it varies with the times. I do think, though, that we are living in a period where um, there is sort of there is an alignment between what you would reasonably describe as American Christianity and American conservatism in a way that there hasn't always been historically. And I think that that drives a lot of the kind of stuff that drives you nuts. Well, right. I, I do wonder whether uh, religious conservatives would feel as as enthusiastic about religious appeals when the Democrats do say, okay, we're fighting fire with fire, right, and, and start making arguments for the social uh, gospel, re- redistribution of wealth. Uh, it is not at all clear to me that uh, the Sermon on the Mount is a uh, support of, of unfettered capitalism. Uh, Possibly not. I, I, I would argue not. And um, <clears throat> so they have had the monopoly, and, and when they start facing uh, alternative arguments based on scripture for political ends, I don't know how they will respond. Are we then going to get into a debate about God's word and what that means, and and how will that take place in the public sphere? To me, uh, and, and, and maybe you, the religious left and religious right would be happy to argue on those grounds, but let's take it another step. What if a, a congressman from Detroit argues that the you know tenth surah from the Quran uh, supports not just the government uh, bailing out the auto industry, but the UAW running uh, Chrysler and GM? I, I don't know how one responds to arguments like that in in a secular society. So that's why I would say if you're going to make those arguments, you make them on, on purely empirical grounds rather than invoking divine authority because people that don't share your particular view of, of God or your holy book, those, those arguments are simply, mean, they're literally meaningless. Um, so... But how all right, so but how big a role do you think the sort of in in national American politics, right? National politics and also sort of elite argumentation of the kind that goes on in the pages of City Journal, National Review, the Weekly Standard, the sort of flagship conservative publications and so on. How much argumentation at at that level do you think partakes of sort of a straightforward for the Bible tells me so kind of thing I mean it, it's, it seems to me that what you see are sort of again layers of argumentation where yes you know if you there are, there are politicians and preachers and, and pundits who will make the you know make the kind of tenth story of the Quran kind of argument about issues ranging from gay marriage on the right to poverty on the left. You know, if you listen to Al Sharpton, you can you know you'll you'll get a certain kind of Christian politics that is left wing, right? But that's going on. But simultaneously, I mean, I think a lot of the arguments that take place about even about the most hot button culture war issues. You have people 
trying to make those make arguments on the level of um, you know empiricism and reason and so on and appeals to sort of common principles I mean if you look at the arguments that the pro-life movement makes for instance you have lots of people who say you know um, abortion's wrong because the Bible says so and so on um, but the bulk of pro-life argumentation has been on what I think is fair to describe as sort of strictly liberal grounds, human rights-based argumentation and so on. And I think you can see how this plays out in the debates over abortion versus the debates over gay marriage. The debate over abortion has basically remained static. I mean, you know, allowing for some shifts and so on over the past 30 years, the same percentage of Americans is pro-life today roughly as was pro-life in 1980, the same proportion as pro-choice and so on. And I think that's because that's a debate that really is taking place along, you know, where, where both sides are making sort of competing liberal claims. They're both making appeals to human rights, the rights of the woman on the one hand and the rights of the unborn on the other. Then if you look at gay marriage, where the opponents of gay marriage, I think, have never found a way to argue in a truly liberal vein, I think. There, you know, there have been sort of sustained attempts, but they don't, I don't think they've been completely successful. And as a result, you've seen public opinion shift dramatically on, on gay marriage. I mean, it, it, it's, it seems to me that th there's a kind of self-correction that takes place. I mean, I think, I think that, you know, where ultimately, I think the, you know, the sort of liberal paradigm tends to be the controlling paradigm in American politics. Well, I think you're right, Ross, that generally American political discussion is couched in, in empirical terms and, and the explicit appeals from revelation are relatively marginal. Nevertheless, uh, during the Bush years, we did have Bush say that he believes that freedom is God's gift and that his foreign policy was based in, in part on, on that vision of uh, America's role in spreading God's gift of freedom throughout the world. And that, that to me is uh, not just because I, I oppose the Iraq War, but I, I just find that, that that type of argument and, and reasoning uh, is disturbing because, again, it's, it's in a realm beyond uh, Re access to my own reason, at least. Okay, well, I... Uh, but as far as... I, I, I mean, I think, I think that the Iraq War was a mistake, and I think that Bush's second inaugural address is a really pretty appalling document from a conservative perspective. So I, I agree with you there. On the other hand, if you look back across American history, I don't think... I think that Bush's rhetoric is consonant with the rhetoric that American presidents have used going all the way back to the founding era. And I mean, and I think here's where I'm... I'm a little bit skeptical of the idea that there's, you know, I, I agree with you, the United States is a liberal republic. I'm a little more skeptical that you can, you can say it's a, you know, it's a secular republic. Because from the beginning, I mean, you know, yes, there is no reference to God in the Constitution, but there's clearly a tradition of American civil religion going back to the Declaration of Independence where the premise of the American experiment is Bush's premise that, you know, we hold the, um, that, um, all men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And you see that running in different ways, down through Lincoln, down through Woodrow Wilson, down through John F. Kennedy, all the way to Bush. Well, I guess there's no question. You're, you're absolutely right. And I don't think I would have any uh, hope or to, to purge that tradition from American discourse. I guess my, my argument is just a, a, a narrower one, which is that let's acknowledge that there are plenty of conservatives uh, who do not take their inspiration from any kind of uh, holy text and that find a, an equally compelling tradition in Hobbes and Locke uh, of limited rights based on social compact. We, are, are, we do have a tradition of invoking God, but ours is a country founded on a public act of, of compact. Uh, and there have been also arguments explicitly that the Senate ratified a treaty uh, with Islamic Tripoli after the Constitution, soon after the Constitution was, was signed that said this America is not a nation founded on the Christian religion. Right. So you can find those, those strands as well. Uh, and Jefferson said our civil rights are in no way dependent on, on uh, religious truth. 
So, again, I... I Jefferson I, said a lot of things. Well, that's true. He, 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 but no, 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 I, I, I can see the So point. do I we just, all. So do we all, probably. Um, but, but again, I'm, I also just find it frustrating uh, the, the warnings that without religious faith, we're all headed towards a state of anarchy and uh, and abuse because I, I, that, that's just not the case. That's not how I understand how humans are, are raised. I think that morality uh, comes from an innate sense of, of our own value and the value of those closest to us, which then gets extended uh, to, a, a, one hopes, a larger sphere. And sheer authority, you know, that I think habit, parents in, in, uh, enforce habit in their children, a habit of, of uh, self-discipline and, and following rules, and that that uh, needs to be understood as extraordinarily important, and, and that invoking God is not necessary to teaching kids to be law-abiding, respectful Individuals. I, I, in fact, I wonder. I, I was not raised in a religious home, and and was, frankly, not exposed to religion for most of my life. But I'm not quite sure how that would work in a religious home. Whether you you need to say, you know, don't hit your daughter because God or your 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 little sister because uh, God said not to. It seems to me that these are somewhat self-evident uh, norms of behavior. And well, when, when chaos breaks out, it's I mean, not yeah, it's so not necessarily because of uh, a religious breakdown. You know, after the Iraq invasion, when looting broke out, those Iraqis hadn't suddenly lost their faith in God, but sovereign authority uh, had disappeared. And and I think that people obey the law out of a sense of the fragility of social order, out of habit. And frankly, out of fear of getting caught, um, and those are all valid reasons. Um, and I, 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 the actual commandments in the Bible are, are relatively narrow compared to the enormous complexity of civil society, and and the rules and, and laws that we do obey need to come out of a broader sense than the specific commandments of any given uh, religious text. But isn't it possible that um, appeals to religion and appeals to God are a kind of appeal to authority? I mean, in, in, in the sense in the sense that you're describing. I mean, I, I agree. People, you know, people people behave themselves in large part out of a fear of getting caught. Um, but one of the people, one of the beings, you might say, who could potentially catch them is God. And I think part of you know part of the argument that that belief in God, broadly speaking, is good for societal order and so on, is that God is the person who enforces who enforces the law when nobody's watching. God is the person who, you know, is is watching you when you cheat on a test. God is the person is the person who's watching you when you, you know, when you commit a crime that you know you're not going to get caught for by a civil authority and so on. And, you know, and th this is, I'm, you know, this is a vast generalization, clearly. But I think that, you know, one of the things that I would say is that I think a secular conservative, while I agree, under no obligation to assume that belief in God is good for social order should have a bias in that direction only because the weight of human experience over history has been that religion has been an integral part in different ways of almost every functioning society. And in the postmodern West, in certain, in certain respects, we're embarking on an experiment in forming a society that, in which religion doesn't play the kind of role that it's traditionally played. And this experiment is still really in its infamy, in, in infamy, that's <laughs> a Freudian slip, in its we'll infancy. I, I just, yeah. Where, you know, I mean, if you, look, if you look at sort of religious practice in Europe, right, we've had about 30 to 35 years of heavy secularization. If you look at religious practice in the United States, we've had sort of a more modest kind of secularization. And, I, I mean, I guess all, all that I, w I would say on that front is that I'd say it's too soon to tell. I guess about what, how well a society without God functions in the long run. The fact that, like, you know, people in Scandinavian countries still behave like, you know, modest, law-abiding Lutherans one generation after they were actual Lutherans, I don't think that tells you that much about the long-term prospects of that kind of society. And I'm, 
you, you certainly may be right. I just think a sort of conservative bias and disposition would incline you to be wary of the assumption that, you know, the sort of idea of a metaphysical authority underlying, you know, underlying society and underlying right and wrong and so on doesn't have value. Well, you're right, Ross, that uh, conservatives should be wary of, of radical change, although there's certainly many uh, principles that conservatives once embraced, like monarchy or uh, severe restrictions on, on uh, suffrage, that uh, we no longer do. Um, but I would say that the stretch of, of uh, secularization has been going on far longer, uh, that religion today, is, as I say, is, is just a shadow of its former self. Uh, and I would argue that the course of, of Western history has been towards greater uh, compassion, uh, reasonableness of, beha of behavior, respect for rights, as religion has been pushed really to the margins of, of society. Uh, I, I don't think many of us really would want to live at a time when the church was at the height of its power and when uh, religious faith was far more self-confident and, and crusading. Uh, you know, whether you would want to live in a Lutheran principality during the Thirty Years' War or... Uh, <laughs> well, nobody would want to live in a Lutheran principality ever. during the Thirty Years' War. Well, but... but well, not, not but you know, if you really been... like being a mercenary, you probably would. <laughs> well... There's, there's probably people that, uh, you know, got, got by somehow, but it was, it was not a, the, the state of the world when religion had a far greater uh, claim on, on public life was precisely what the founders of this country were trying to get away from. And when you look at, say, the treatment of prisoners, the treatment of children, uh, the sense of, of human rights, I think those are far superior today in the 20, 21st century than they were four centuries ago. Uh, there were, you know, numerous practices that were tolerated by religious authorities, slavery being one of them. Uh, the Catholic Church rarely, if ever, to my knowledge, objected to the spread of slavery, nor did the Anglican Church. Um, so. Well, you're right, we should be cautious of experiments. But to me, I would say that there is evidence that's coming in, and uh, I don't see Europe as any more on the uh, tending towards immorality than here. In fact, I would say if you want to get, a say, a, a, a highway contract built without corruption, without threats of kidnapping to the CEO, you're better off doing it in Scandinavia than you are in, in highly Catholic Mexico. And within this country, uh, the, the most religious people, some of the most uh, religiously conservative, socially conservative, like blacks, have the highest rate of out-of-wedlock births and, and crime. So the, these are complicated issues, and obviously there's other factors playing in as well. Um, but, yeah, and but I mean, I the story of Western history has also been a story of a steady increase in material prosperity. And that steady, you know, and that steady increase in material prosperity has driven, you know, I mean, again, disentangling these various trends is a difficult thing to do. But, you know, it, I think you can argue endlessly about whether, you know, does, does cruelty diminish because religion has diminished and liberalism has, you know, increased its way, or does cruelty diminish because society is richer and richer and more technologically proficient, and so people feel comfortable doing away with cruelty? I mean, I think, you know, if you look at, you can see this happening in debates in the United States today over, over vegetarianism and the treatment of animals and so on, you know, you could say, well, these are debates that reflect the gradual universalization of liberal principles extending even to the higher animals and so on. But you could also say that, uh, you know, the world got rich enough that people could afford the luxury of worrying about how their animals were treated. And it's not clear to me that that is, uh, you know, is sort of connected really to the declining power of the declining temporal power of the church, for instance. No, it's not connected to the declining and, and power of the church, but I would say it is connected to the rise of a uh, 
extension of rights and and of equality that I think is more of a, a secular uh, value, that tolerance is a secular value, it's not a religious one. Uh, but I agree that, that affluence gives us the right to worry about things that we didn't. But I, I would say bear baiting is not based on uh, any kind of economic uh, necessity or, or poverty. I think that, again, we have just become a more, more tolerant and, and, and caring society at the same time that uh, religion has been pushed to the margins. And, you know, another thing that I would say, Ross, is that you're right that human beings do call upon God as the source of their sense of justice and fairness and compassion. But I, I find, say, Feuerbach's analysis very persuasive that we are projecting onto God our own human values of justice and fairness, that if we actually followed the, the uh, model that God gives us of treatment of human beings, uh, this would be an even more unjust world than we have today. That if, if human fathers behaved uh, as, as the divine father did, they would be hauled off into court. Uh, God apparently has enormous power, in, in infinite power and infinite knowledge, uh, and yet stands by throughout history for the daily slaughter of the innocents. I mean, uh, the way so a father, is, so the way a father should behave, there, let me, just a, a specific sure. example, uh, this August in a campsite in New Hampshire, uh, there was a flash flood, and a family uh, SUV got swept away, and the father managed to get the wife and a child one of his children out, but a eight-year-old girl was trapped inside, and he was frantic, running along the side of the, the sudden ravine that had been created by this flash flood, and she was eventually uh, drowned. Now, that's how we would expect a, a father filled with love for his children to behave, but God had the power to stop that, and I know that because believers tell me all the time that God answers prayers and intervenes and keeps us safe. Uh, John Ashcroft said that after 9-11, God kept us safe from another terrorist attack. I mean, this is a, a, a ubiquitous trope in religious discourse. But at that moment, uh, while well, the human father was doing everything within his power to, uh, to prevent that girl's death, God chose not to. So... I would say part of the sort of secular project is just reclaiming these virtues as, as human ones. And what religion claims as religious values are simply human values, which is uh, pity, mercy, gratitude, love. Uh, and you don't need to project them on a, onto a god to see that these are the absolute basis of, of human society and that they're, they're what make human society tolerable? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think they're what makes human society tolerable. Um, it's not clear to me that they're the basis, the absolute basis of human society. I mean, there are, I think it's fair to say there are a lot of human behaviors, impulses, values, and so forth, and we designate a certain group of them as good and preferable to another set. Um, but we make that distinction presumably based on some kind of standard. I mean, the fact that, you know, you, you think that the slaughter of innocents is a bad thing, right? It's not, it's not, if you look across human history, it's not necessarily the case that all human beings everywhere agree with you that the slaughter of innocents is something to be deplored. No, certainly not. And, 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 and whether it's religious or political people, that's, that's absolutely right. And religion right, has not want, served as a break on that. You're right. Well, but also, I mean, so a, a, lot, of, a lot of what I think goes on, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, it's not exactly the opposite of Feuerbach's point, but if you, I, I guess my view is that the kind of argument that you just made, right, the argument that, you know, religious believers say that God is a good, all-loving parent and so on, but he's not a good, all-loving parent because, you know, he's done X, Y, and Z, is a result of 
um, you know, it's, it's sort of an inevitable consequence in the sense of the Christian revolution in our understanding of um, who God is and also what the universe is and human society and so on. And that revolution has been working itself out throughout Western society for 2,000 years. And I think modern liberalism is, to a large extent, it, it is a, you know, it's, it's a secularized version of that revolution, but it is a version of that revolution. And if you look at the kinds of sort of metaphysical claims that even Hobbes and Locke, and, you know, people argue about whether they were religious believers or not, but they, they do start their, they do ground their arguments at some point in metaphysical claims that are related to a semi-Christian conception of the nature of God. And that's not the only conception of the nature of God there is. And in fact, there have been lots of other conceptions of the nature of God. And even within the sort of Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, if you look at Judaism and Islam, I think, I think their portraits of the nature of God are much less vulnerable to the charges that you just laid at God's door. I mean, they're more likely to say, well, God is, God is, you know, God's ways are not our ways, and the kind of, you know, the kind of application you just did where you say, well, you know, my sense of justice is violated when God allows this to happen. You know, I mean, if you read the sort of, the book of Job, right, and, and you look at sort of God's answer to that question, the answer is not, well, I'm all, you know, I'm all good and you just don't understand why. It's, no, look, I'm so far above you that, you know, your sense of what's going on right. here is not going to be my sense. But what Christianity does is it injects uh, what I think is, you know, not, not a new idea. It's present in Judaism, but, you know, a, a pretty radical shift in how we think about God and how we think about the universe and how we think about which human impulses and emotions and so on are good and consonant with justice and and consonant with the divine will and which aren't. And that opens up God to all kinds of critiques because, you know, if if Jesus is the manifestation of God, right, if God is the all-loving um, being who, you know, has his only son lay down his life for the world and so on, then, you know, then it, it yeah, it, it creates sort of the response of, well, if he's this loving you know why won't he save my wife from drowning? But that's but that is in 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 part an artifact of, you know, of of the fact that we now live in a society that's sort of shot through with unacknowledged Christian premises, and and I think See, that like and, and I think that just saying well you know I we would, can all agree, agree that there are these human values. I don't think we can all agree once you. I think it's very easy to step away from Christian premises and say. You know, well, actually, what what is so wrong with slavery? What is so wrong with X or Y and Z? I, I guess I would disagree that those are specifically Christian premises. I, I, and I hear this not you're not making it so uh, uh, you're not you're not making the chauvinistic point. But I have heard from Christian commentators claiming a vast swath of human virtues as uniquely Christian, and I. I'm, I'm puzzled by that because I think uh, what are seen sometimes as Christian virtues, but, but you know, I've heard from a Wall Street Journal columnist that things like uh, courage or, or faithfulness or, or uh, uh, you know, gratitude are specifically Christian. Those have been present in human societies no, everywhere. No, I, com I completely agree. What and, I'm and saying is, is that... Not is at that all a, well, you're saying that you... Christian I, God is viewed as as just and loving. No, no, I'm I'm saying that what Christianity does is is that it, it and no, th look, this is this is you know, Christianity is one of quite a few <laughs> quite a few religious and non-religious standards by which we assess uh, right which human impulses and activities are are good and which are bad. Right, but Christianity has been the dominant standard in the West for a long period of time, and. So, so no. Look, yes, gratitude is not you know, gratitude is not unique to Christianity, and there are plenty of other traditions that say gratitude is a good thing, and so on and so forth. But the particular way that we in the West today assess which which impulses we have are good and which are bad, and which you know which human human values are good and which are bad, is deeply conditioned, I think, by Christianity. Well, I think when you when when you say, I mean, and, and it goes it goes all the way down to things like equality of the sexes, right? I mean, yes, clearly Christianity has been enmeshed with patriarchal structures of authority throughout its two thousand years, but it's also true that you know in in the Roman Empire and after Christianity 
set up a standard that moved Western society in a direction of greater gender equity. And and that's not, I don't think that you Chris, can step outside and out, outside of human society and say, well, we know that gender equity is a value that we support, you know, based on reason alone. Well, I guess I would say, given that uh, the church was completely at peace with uh gender inequity, with racial inequity, with uh, class inequity and, and political inequity, and raised not a peep of protest, the Catholic Church raised not a peep of protest uh, at well, inequalities that, that well, that's today... Well, really, that's not really true. Oh, I, I, mean, the, I, mean, I, don't the, think, the Catholic, I don't think the Catholic Church was a force for liberalism. I think it, it tended to support... The Catholic Church uh, existing, wasn't a force for liberalism in the 18th and 19th. Uh, throughout most of its history. So I would say that the evolution of, of, uh, of Western values, perhaps it's, it's Christianity is the source, perhaps Christianity is part of the evolution of the West. Uh, and, and, you know, the Renaissance started by rediscovering classical texts and classical values. That was seen as an extraordinary uh, infusion of political uh, energy and, and philosophical and, and, and moral energy into the West. And, and the concept of, of democracy, of the use of reason to try and understand the world of science dates back to, to Greek times before uh, Christianity. But, but I guess maybe my point is just a, a more modest one, Ross, which is simply that if even if I wanted to concede to you that these were Christian values that have somehow uh, made the West such a source of freedom and equality, that the Christian values are, are humans are endowing Christianity with impulses that originate with ourselves and don't come from God, and that the human thirst for justice and for treating likes alike and making sure that uh, people get what they deserve is clearly something that arises from humans and is not modeled on uh, any sort of divine being. Because again, the way the world works, we live in a state of absolute randomness. It is random. Uh, what child gets born with a fatal birth defect and what child is born with a, a wonderful endowment of all uh, his right, rightful faculties. Uh, and it's human effort to try and overcome that randomness, which is our God-given state, and, and to try and make sure that everybody actually does uh, get what they deserve, that, that drives... Uh, the improvement in, in Western society. So, again, I, I think it's just a, a sense of wanting to place human beings at the center of our world rather than looking elsewhere uh, for salvation. And I also, for me, I'm just puzzled by how one uh, is supposed to answer religious questions. I I understand the utilitarian argument for religion, and I'm I'm a little more skeptical that it is the absolute uh, sine qua non of a of a stable, law-abiding society. No, but, I, I, but, I think you're right to be skeptical I, about that. I don't. Let me, let me I go think on, that sorry. what matters is ultimately the truth, even if it's the case that uh, we all need religion in order to be happy or or lead fulfilled lives, I still think it matters whether what you believe is true or not. And I'd, I'd rather know the truth and be unhappy than uh, live a lie. And I'm, I'm perplexed now in our current state of uh, religious tolerance and, and uh, sort of kissy-wissy between all religions, how you go about persuading somebody uh, that their religious faith is, is not true. I, I take it that you probably don't believe that the Book of Mormon is a, a revealed uh, truth or that God spoke to Joseph Smith uh, and provided mm. him with magic spectacles. And if uh, not... No, I don't, I don't believe that the Book of Mormon is revealed truth. But why I would, not? I would, I would be agnostic about whether 
God spoke to Joseph Smith. You just you would just be agnostic. You don't you don't have an instinct one way or another that this seems highly far more unlikely than likely that uh, I would that God I would say that my, and and told brought, well the second half, the second half so that he could the, read the magic the magic spectacles yeah. part I'm skeptical about mm-hmm. the the idea that Joseph Smith had a religious experience I would say I'm less skeptical about. Um, because I think it's pretty clear that religious experience is a, you know, and whatever it may be, we don't, you know, we don't have to stipulate that it's coming, that, you know, that there is an external source of religious oh, experience. Sure, of course, but then certainly, I agree with you. certainly, Absolutely. religious experience is a, again, pretty ubiquitous, not, ubiquitous, uh-huh. not universal in the sense that lots of people go through life without having religious experience. Right. But, people but experience it's a pretty a ubiquitous they do. part, no question. part of part of human human existence. And when you have figures like Smith, who is, you know, I think it's fair to describe certain people as religious geniuses in the sense that they have sort of a genius for um, for convincing other people that, you know, that, that their religious beliefs are, are true and so forth. I think it's reasonable to think that they are participating in a, in a deeper sense than your average person in whatever it is that religious experience is. Now, you know that that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that Joseph Smith wasn't also um, you know making stuff up as he went along and and a consummate bullshit artist. That's you know I, I mean the, the history the history of religion is filled with figures like that as well. But I'd be I'd be hesitant about you know about just sort of saying that you know that, that there was no actual religious experience at the root of whatever Joseph Smith. Well, I, I don't. In that case, I don't quite know if if there was a religious experience in the sense of. <laughs> Of he believed that he was in contact with the divine. That may right. be. That may be as opposed to him being a, a, a sheer huckster and 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 deliberately setting out to um, defraud and and, uh, and, right. and deceive people. But but that's a very modest statement. Uh, he went far beyond that and had a whole. Well, of course, it's a modest a statement. I'm not, a, I'm not a Mormon, well, but, so but then, you wouldn't expect me to make a more comprehensive statement about but then, that. But look, but a lot of religion is an to, attempt. How are we supposed to evaluate the claims of that particular religion if not based on historical evidence and and our no? Reasons? I think that that's. So, I think that that's that is. A lar- to a large extent, how you, I mean, I think you evaluate the truth claims of religion the way you evaluate the truth claims of anything. You, a, a combination of, you know, there isn't a position of pure reason where people are going to be evaluating these things from. I mean, the fact well, that I you grew up in an you. agnostic household and I grew up in a religious household automatically means that I'm probably more favorably disposed towards, towards religion than you are for just sort of primal sort of pre-rational reasons. That's that's clearly true. But no, I mean, I think you va- evaluate them out of a combination of you know reason, historical evidence, and your own and your own experience. And so I think it's it's totally valid for you know. If, let's say the, I'm raised in the, the let's say I'm raised in the Mormon Church, right? And you know, I, I think it's and I have and I in the course of my lifetime as a practicing Mormon, I have what appear to me to be in the kind of encounters with the divine that Mormonism is promising. I think it's reasonable for me to include that evidence in my overall evaluation of whether Mormonism is true. And I think that that's true of most religious believers, that you have a combination of sort of, you know, rational assessment of the founding texts of your religion and its history joined to the the extent to which the religion that you belong to fulfills its promise, and that promise is an encounter with the numinous and with whatever it is that's at the foundation of our universe. And that's where I mean, if you you know, if you look at sort of the historical record of Christianity, you have both of those things, both of those projects going on simultaneously and sustaining Christianity throughout time. I mean, the Gospels themselves are. A, a group of people, you know, at some period after the fact of some kind of transformative religious experience, trying to and analyze it, recount it, and make sense of it in theological terms. And Christians have been essentially engaged in that project ever since. They've also been engaged in the project of trying to get in touch with God directly themselves. And so you have a rational tradition in Christianity and a mystical tradition in Christianity, and these two overlap. And it's it's not clear to me that this is. I mean, well, yeah, I'll. I'll <laughs> well, I get, again, I just think that somebody outside any given tradition uh, is going to ask questions that do not uh, don't come from a uh, 
sort of lived experience of that, but are asking for evidence and and holding up the claims to uh, what are I think legitimate demands for proof and and reasonableness. And when you're outside uh, most religions, I, th I I would assume that you would hold up other religions to the same standards uh, that I would. And, well, sure, and, and, and I evaluate them, and so. I, again, given that I find that uh, most religious claims cannot withstand uh, what the, the most basic uh, empirical testing, I would rather uh, base Well, but base, which, which how, religious claims do you have in I, mind? I mean, I mean, so for instance, well, right. for instance okay, I'll give Joseph you, Smith. I'll give you, a, for instance, um, Recently, uh, Benedict the Sixteenth canonized a Brazilian saint who was a uh, 18th century friar, and nuns in Brazil have been manufacturing little pills that contain uh, prayers to Friar Galvão, and uh, if you swallow these pills, it is believe that the friar will answer your prayers and cure you. And the Pope decided to certify as miracles uh, in the 1990s. A girl took one of these pills and was cured of uh, a liver or kidney disease, and a woman who had had multiple miscarriages was able to bring a child relatively to term. Uh, I, I can think of absolutely no uh, basis by which swallowing pills containing uh, little written p prayers could have an effect on one's chances of, of delivering a baby or, or uh, recovering from kidney disease. But that's rather the point, isn't it? I mean, it's supposed to be no. a miracle. Well, I, I, and you actually believe that, do you, do you really believe that that is how that worked, that, that, that there was a divine intercession or that those, those prayers in a pill have an effect to, uh, well, to there's cure clearly, disease? I don't, I don't I, think I, that the I, prayers I cannot, in, in the pill is, are, having, are having, I mean, this, it this, seems this, to me this that to the me case is a complete of the prayers in the pills are a case of everything where that we have uh, well, of course, it's a violation. In, in, it's, uh, it's a miracle, right? But well, I, so what are the odds of a miracle happening? Absolutely. In this case, I would say absolutely zero. But by what standard? A miracle is, by definition, a violation of the existing laws of um, of, of of the natural world, right? So we we base our probabilities on those laws. So what's the empirical grounds for declaring? How did the Pope know that that is what occurred? And and so you're well, the satisfied. Tradition, I mean, the, you know, there's then, there's obviously that you know, as with all of these things, there are enormous excesses in the analysis and the credulity about miracles and so on. But traditionally, the Vatican has conducted investigations and they have you know attempt, attempted to establish the likelihood of you know, the miraculous cure, the miraculous treatment, and so on, the cancer going into remission, and so on and so forth, and attempted to establish the sort of, medi you know, to, to what extent is there a medical explanation for what happened, and to what extent is science mystified by what happened, and so on. And now, you know, I, I think there are all kinds of valid criticisms of that as a way of going about certifying a miracle, but it's not as if they're just, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's not as if, in general, the Vatican does not state the likelihood of a miracle except in cases where it seems to be an extraordinary event. Uh -huh. Well, I, uh, people have uh, ch have children after miscarriages sure. uh, all the time. Look, I, and, and, and I would say that uh, to perpetuate that kind of uh, uh, belief is not doing anybody any good and that the, the glory of, of human thought and, and mind is in the exploration of, of uh, science and being able to work out through the scientific method uh, a patient understanding of how reality works. And I, to uh, accept, well, I, to I accept, agree with that, but I don't, I don't think Pope Benedict would, would no, disagree he would, with No, he would that. agree, but uh, I would say that 
this this to me is a is a repudiation of of humans greatest strength which is our use of reason and and the empirical method uh, to throw up your hands and 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 send out superstition which is no different as far as I'm concerned with uh, somebody sacrificing chickens uh, it is a, a mis mistaken understanding of how reality works and, and what nature is uh, that is a, a sideshow to how, how we are going to improve the human lot, which is through the patient work of, of science and understanding Well, biology. sure, but there are also limits to how far we can improve the human lot, right? Absolutely and, human, and human beings do have aspirations that go beyond just adding an extra five years to their lifespan, right? And, I mean, that's one of the many places where religion factors into human society. And, you know, I mean, you, you can say that belief in miraculous cures is standing in the way of medical advances, and in some cases that may be true. On the other hand, stating that, you know, hoped for, you know, sort of, Ho re stating that religious hopes are standing in the... I mean, the, the extent of the religious hope so far exceeds the, the promised benefits of science that you can, I think, see why people go in for it. I mean, you know, the, the promised benefits of science are that, you know, your beloved father will be with you an extra five years, and that's wonderful and absolutely worth pursuing. But your beloved father is still going to die, and there is still going to be, you know, a sort of a, you know, not ununderstandable human impulse to want, you know, to want death actually conquered. And there are people who are embarked on the work of actually conquering death, <laughs> you know, the sort of Ray Kurzweil's of the world and so on. And I think that that's a, is probably going to become a more prominent kind of crackpot science over the next couple of centuries. But overall, the kind of yearnings that produce religious feeling aren't going away and aren't going to be satisfied by science. And, you know, they, if, if God does not exist, then they are unsatisfiable yearnings. But they're still yearnings, and they're still yearnings that are, I think, valid and reasonable to, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, if it's reasonable to pursue the human yearning for justice on this earth, why isn't it reasonable to pursue the human yearning to for the discovery of transcendence and the discovery of something beyond the universe as we understand it? Well, I guess because I don't think we have any uh, ability to discover it. I, I, I think theological discourse is uh, fiction, really. I mean, it is it is a sometimes a uh, internally semi-coherent, but it's based on nothing outside of itself that I can uh, begin to establish whether it's correct or not. Uh, and and you're right. Obviously, humans. Uh, fear death, and and they yearn for something uh, that would allow them to to survive forever. Uh, the I guess the secularist answer to that would be that embrace life currently. This is all we have, and but but what we have is an enormous amount that human beings have the capacity to create beauty that is unbearable. Uh, I, I can't begin to uh, have time enough to appreciate and, 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 and be grateful for the beauties of Mozart or Bach or Chopin. And uh, I don't think we do need to project and, and, and make up a, a divinity beyond human life. I understand the, the hope for uh, ultimate justice when, when uh, we see that the human world is so often riven by randomness and injustice. But, but I, I guess I would say again, it's, it's human beings that have it in their power to, to correct that randomness. Uh, and and I'm celebrating, point. well... Up and I mean, point, I right, mean, one conservative it, but inside, I would... the, But where we reach the end, God is not going to bail us out. And because what we see from, from God's own, if, if God exists, what he tolerates is the absolute opposite of what human beings yearn for. It is not justice and it is not love. If, if, if God had a passion for justice the way we do, uh, there would not be a tsunami 
that wipes out 10,000 people. Uh, God, God benefits from well, only, a set of double standards that is so far that her- beyond anything that affirmative action has ever uh, produced. God gets credit always for the good things and never gets any kind of criticism for the bad things. So a religious impulse would go as follows. Let's say there's a, uh, recently there was a, a uh, earthquake in Guatemala that wiped out a village. If there are three children surviving in that village, that will be attributed to uh, God's beneficence and God's love. People forget, what about the others? I'm, I'm always amazed by the narcissism, if I can use a, a negative term of believers, when I hear constantly people thanking God for their own uh, recovery from cancer, uh, not paying attention to the fact that the person in the bed next to them actually died. I, I had a post But don't on you think it's because right. they're paying attention to the person in the bed next to them? I mean, a lot no, of, I would a say, lot of I religious would say thankfulness is that driven that by a sense of life's fragility and a sense no, that if God, you're, if you know, you're if God exists, God he answers me, every prayer, but sometimes the answer is no. And if well, the answer is yes, be? in your Why case, would that be? I would say that the bare minimum we ask of lawgivers is to treat like cases alike. Now, if we assume that God does follow a human idea of justice, which is, again, very simply, like cases alike. Two innocent people uh, should either expect to die together or live together. Uh, and, and, for instance, another example of, of what I say, would say is the narcissism. I had a post on Secular Right uh, after the fatal crash in Buffalo of the Continental Flight uh, that killed about 50 people, every, almost everybody on, everybody on board and somebody on the ground, saying those people who had seen in the safe landing of the U.S. air flight in the Hudson River, uh, who had seen in that uh, God's intervention, please explain the uh, continental fatal crash in Buffalo uh, a month ago. And one reader wrote in and said, well, I don't necessarily know that much about religion, but my father was going to get on the Continental flight, and he didn't. Uh, to me, that's what God is all about. Well, what about the people that did get on the flight? If you're going to thank God for, for keeping your father off that flight, you have to explain why he allowed uh, the other people to get on. And either, either you're going to say, well, we can't understand God's ways, in which case... You don't know that it was God that kept him off the flight. And if you don't understand God's ways, it just may be that evil is a better representation of, of God's uh, intentions for humanity than good. I mean, we all assume, and I assume too, that the big problem of religion is theodicy and the problem of evil. How do we know? It may be that the real problem is the problem of good and that, and that God is, in fact, extraordinarily malevolent and what needs to be explained is why occasionally good things happen to human beings. So what I find is a constant shifting of the terms that when, when something good happens, we say God's will is transparent. And then when, when clearly uh, a grotesque injustice happens, either through uh, you know, genetic uh, 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 failure and, and, and children being born, with dire, fatal, painful diseases or natural disaster, we say that God becomes all of a sudden veiled and and cannot be understood. Well, you can't have it both ways. No, I agree. I, I mean, I and I, I don't think, you know, I, I think that your critique of a kind of, you know, facile reading of God and God's intentions is it's not completely facile. Correct. It's, it's constant. It's it, that is that is the well, very it's constant. Ed, that human, the very well, wait, I mean, come on. Human beings are facile people. I well, mean, if you, but, but you you don't have to just look at a, a debates are. about religion I, I I to see people saying facile things. Well, and if you look no, at the debate about the tsunami, that. right? There was in fact an incredibly vigorous debate. Um, in, I mean, it's it's worth it's worth reading. Uh, I think his name is David Bedley Hart, who wrote a long piece in the Wall Street Journal that turned into a really interesting book. Um, he's an uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox theologian. I says he's the new criterion. Uh huh. I'm sorry. 
Right. I, I saw something he'd written in the New Criterion. Yeah, he, write, he writes the New Criterion. Yeah, he's a very smart guy. And, um, you know, and he was writing, a, you know, he wrote an extended critique of some of the people who were saying, well, you know, this is God's will and God uses all things for good and so on. I mean, there, there is... There is a also, in addition to the sort of facile readings of God's intention, there's a very lively debate within the Christian theological tradition about, you know, about how Christians should respond to tragedy and so on. And I would say that, you know, there's a broad consensus that the way Christians, that the way sort of your everyday Christian believer responds that, that bothers you so much isn't the right way to respond and reflects a kind of shallow faith and a misunderstanding of God's purposes. But again, but I don't think we should be... it's what we hear from supp- priests all the time. I mean, I, 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 it is an absolute standard standard uh, practice in churches to pray to God, to pray for people who are uh, sick within the congregation, and to thank God when things happen uh, that, that humans uh, value. Uh, so this is not some fringe practice that is somehow carried on no, by the know-nothing. It is, it is no, the very essence of Christianity, which is to say that we owe right, that the our, broadly, our good things from attitude, God's the love. The appropriate attitude to existence is one of gratitude. Yes. I would and agree that, with that. And that, that, and that, and, that, and that, that extends is, to the... Yeah, that the and that's that the, a secular value, too. I think that, you know, I am, ext- I, am, I am incredibly grateful for the human beings that have who, made who this you, world... Who are you grateful to? To them, right? To them, absolutely. Right, okay. Well, if, if, if God is the God. author of the universe, then, then then it makes sense for Christians to be grateful to God, broadly speaking. And look, and the Christian... Look, As the a Christian deist, the, God, tradition. that's right. I would just not say... I, I do not know what started the universe, and neither do you. None of us do. And, and it may be that this is something beyond humans' capacity to figure out, and it may be as well that the way our minds are structured with causality... Uh, is, is ultimately inappropriate. That it's not necessarily given that that our concepts of 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 cause and of evidence explain the universe. But I I would say uh, if you want to if you want to posit God as a placeholder for ignorance as, as the first cause, assuming we even can be sure that causation is relevant. I'll give you that, but what I won't give you but that's is the not Christian what... version of God, which is of loving and, and justice, because the way I see the world, uh, it is the opposite of, of the way a loving, just God right. would set but things there are, up. There are it's two human things... beings that are responsible for the justice that we've got. Well, right, but there are a couple things to be said, one of which is that the Christian, you know, in Christian tradition, the horizon the horizon of human existence is not fixed by the limits of the world. And that therefore, you know, the fact that somebody dies dies in the tsunami, that micro injustice is remedied in the fullness of time. Now, there's no reason that you have to believe that, but if you did accept that premise, that, you know, in the fullness of time God will wipe away every tear from every eye, and that, you know, those who have done good will will receive their reward, and those who have done evil will receive their reward, and that the sort of micro-experience of injustice in the world will be swamped by the macro-experience of God's love, that's not, you know, that, that does put the kind of suffering that that you, I think, rightly object to in a slightly different kind of perspective. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily redeem it, and I, I don't think that there's any way that I'm going to persuade you that a happy eschatology would redeem human suffering. I'm not always persuaded myself, but that's also why why religion is traditionally spoken of in terms of faith and doubt and yearning and seeking and so on. It's not a form of human knowledge like science. It's not, and uh-huh. and and you can't and it it is, well, it, is, it, is right. it is a quest. Well, I mean, that is what knowledge. that's I guess what I religious say practice is. I would it's a say quest it's for not even knowledge. I would say it's not even knowledge. It is. It is uh, yearning, it is wishful thinking, but it is certainly not knowledge because, again, uh, the idea that we can be sure that there is justice in the world beyond uh, when... Well, God, you can't it would be make sure, a lot, it would certainly be a lot are more efficient you, I mean, are you sure God, that democracy is if, the best form of... Why, I mean, why what, not give us justice now? Why wait till the world beyond? And, and the usual explanations, well, now you are with God... Those are not explanations that we accept when somebody uh, is cured. If it's if it's a a good thing to be with God prematurely, why don't we wish that on everybody? Uh, so, I, I I guess I would just say that that the the hope that there is justice in the world beyond is understandable, um, but it is there is 
It is, it is not based on anything that is knowledge. But I, and I would say again, well, but given what I see... what's your definition of knowledge? I mean, for instance, right? What's like, my what? definition of knowledge? Something that I have evidence for that I okay, can test. And that, is, and that is, we can reach some hope of agreement. I see no agreement uh, uh, between believers of different faiths. I don't know. We haven't persuaded uh, Jews are, are the most some of the most rational uh passionate for people that are passionate for knowledge, Christians have not been able to persuade them after 2,000 years uh, that, that Jesus was the Son of God. I don't know why that is. I would argue, well, I, I would argue because the evidence for it uh, is not universally accept, accessible, well, and the evidence is, is, is uh, it requires a leap of faith that but is, after has nothing years, to do with knowledge. But after 300 years, Western liberals haven't convinced, um, you know, everybody in China and sub-Saharan Africa that liberal democracy is the best form of government, right? I mean, people move in and out of belief systems all the time. But I know those And there arguments. have been Jews who have been con convinced that Christianity is true, and there have been Christians who have been convinced that Judaism is true. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't tell us that Christianity is true and Judaism is false or vice versa any more than the failure of democracy activists to persuade people that democracy is the best system of government in China tells us that democracy isn't the best system of government. I mean, all arenas of human debate and, and knowledge are shot through with uncertainty and with intransigence and with people shifting their beliefs and so on. Ross, you're right, but I, I guess I would, I, would, I would know how I would make the argument for democracy. I would point to the evidence... Uh, of of prosperity, of of longevity, of human beings having uh, greater freedom, greater choice uh, than they've ever had before. Uh, but I would not know how to make an argument for God as loving and just. I, okay. I don't know what, what sort of evidence I would put forward. And I'm I'm willing to argue the democracy. Uh, democracy claims but but, but you're again, arguing the, argument the case for, for democracy the on case. but you're arguing the case for democracy i mean in part you're arguing it on the standards of democracy you're saying you know a government that provides freedom is good because it provides freedom right i mean you know if you i, I mean <laughs> there have been plenty of thinkers within the western tradition in the last 150 years who have said, well, you know, but okay, but if you start with a different standard and you say, you know, the point of human existence is to maximize greatness of one kind or another and, you know, create a more aristocratic kind of man, then democracy is, you know, is, is a great leveler and a creator of mediocrity. Well, and, so and on, I right? actually would agree with that, actually. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I may argue for democracy, but I certainly am not going to impose it on them. And I know that you're also not saying you're going to impose religion on, but we, on anybody else. Uh, and I do think people... Other peoples have a right to say, well, you place a very high value on individual autonomy. Our society doesn't. Uh, we value solidarity uh, and, and order more, and we fear democracy as a source of disorder. And I would say, you know, contrary uh, maybe to, to the Bush view, is that I would give greater latitude to societies to, to make those right. own choices for themselves. Right. Okay. So we, right. But we started here with but, the question but, but look, of whether, whether theology but, but, is knowledge, and I would just say it is not knowledge uh, in any, but you in have any knowledge, of my understandings. But you have knowledge of a lot of things, right? I mean, I think that, like, I think we in the West, we're accustomed to sort of, we're accustomed to thinking about knowledge in terms of scientific standards of evidence, right? But there are all kinds of aspects of your life where you have real knowledge that is not subject to scientific standards of evidence. You cannot prove using the scientific method that democracy is the best form of government, right? But you also can't prove using the scientific method that your mother loves you. But you know your mother loves you, right? But I know that my and mother Christianity, exists. Here's what Christianity holds out. Christianity says if you, if you practice this faith, if you practice this faith, you will, you know, Christianity says God is love, right? God is the author of the universe, and the, fa you know, the foundational principle of the universe is love. And if you practice our faith and attempt to bring your life in accordance with what we think is God's will and communicate with God's will, you will experience this love and you will experience the love in such a way that it makes the kind of suffering that you object to seem vastly less important. And if you look at the people who are practicing this faith in the deepest way, the problem of theodicy seems to recede for them. If you look at the saints and martyrs and mystics, the problem recedes because they are essentially ascending to you know, what you might call a higher a higher state and a higher understanding of the universe. Now well, you I'm can say that, that that's bullshit. Don't agree but it's with that. not 
I'm, well, I'm, well, of course, because I'm, we are. It, it, I, I cannot accept the amount of injustice in the world, and I, again, I would say that it's human beings fighting against that, uh, that that is a very important part of human life. And, but I would agree with you that uh, a, a Christian way of life, the, a, a discipline, a sense of order is a valuable one. Uh, but where I disagree is that those values are ultimately coming from any source outside of human beings. And that, that we are, again, we are projecting our own passion for justice onto something outside of ourselves. Uh, but, but, and I would and, just and suggest that the religious impulses itself, un, I mean, there's a circular thing going on because Christians believe that the passion of justice for justice only exists because God created us to have one. But the passion for justice is also, I mean, in the same way, the same passion for justice that drives you to seek a better world in the here and now is part of what drives the Christian quest for, you know, to, to find God in order to, to, to you know, to, to essentially have the injustices of the world be redeemed in an ultimate as opposed to provisional sense. And that may be folly, I agree, but it is also part of the same quest for justice that you find admirable in the here and now. It's driven That's right. by... Again, I would just say, if, if we want to bring about justice on earth, we should run as fast as possible from the divine model and, and look to ourselves, because what I see uh, in the divine model is a tolerance uh, for injustice and, and allowing uh, completely disparate outcomes for people that, that deserve similar fates. So we're getting it from something other than God, I would say. If God is both uh, omnipotent and omniscient, uh, he, he is not our source of justice. Um, so, but, but you know, I, I, I don't disagree that uh, religious faith has given people the ability to, to overcome great sorrow and and I'm also conscious of the limits of my own knowledge that there are there are experiences of 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 sorrow and suffering that I have not had and uh, so my my experience of human life is is not a full one and and it may be that I am too uh, uh, quick to dismiss the Necessity and and value of, of religious faith. So I I I'm aware of the need on non-believers' parts to be humble towards the limits of their own experience. Um, that well, and on this, and and I think I think we should we should finish up here. But on this, I would I, I mean I think that much of what you object to in contemporary Christianity, and which goes back through two thousand years of Christianity, is the the absence of humility on the part of religious believers. And I think there, I think we can certainly, <laughs> we can close by agreeing that both both the secular and the religious could could do with a slightly higher dose of humility in this debate. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think, uh, right, and, and uh, you know, there is much more that unites us now. I think we are all part of a world, whether we want to call it shaped primarily by Christian values or, or values of the West and individualism. Uh, and, and I think we should be grateful that we are uh, no longer killing for, for religious uh, faith reasons uh, and, and living in a world of tolerance. And, and how we got there, we can, we can uh, disagree <laughs> about, Ross, but I think we're both well, grateful we'll save to it, today. We'll save it for the next, the next blogging head right. session. I'm sure we could wring at least another hour out of this topic. Um, but Heather, it's been a pleasure. Looking and thank forward you, to thank you so much for the conversation. Can't wait for your columns, Ross. Uh, well, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye. Bye.